do a straight line so we didn't block it, access in and out of the subdivision in people's driveways and that kind of thing. We don't want to get on people's property. <coughs> these subdivisions like this, when you find these old cemeteries, people cannot be so nice sometimes. <laughs> they shoot at you? No, local folks do that. <laughs> Only if they think there's enough. These folks aren't local. <laughs> Only on May Day. <laughs> I'm not going to go into a whole lot here because Gary's the expert on his ancestor. But I do want to tell you a couple of things. Uh, this is the Samuel King Sr. that those of you who have taken the first class prehistory to 1860 learned that built that first King Bridge across the French Broad River mm -hmm. in the very early 1800s. So he's a very important person. He was a Revolutionary War veteran, and he was here by, what, 1790 at least, maybe earlier than that. 1778. Well, that's, we found a deed going back 1778, which confirms what I keep teaching you <laughs> in that first class. Um, this cemetery, people knew it was here, but in a sense they really didn't know it was here. And it had been vandalized terribly. I mean, all kinds of horrible stuff was going on in this cemetery. When Pete Green, P.T. Green, built this subdivision, he found the cemetery. It was in horrible condition. Oh, you would not believe. But he donated this land and a lot down there that, according to George Jones and others, was some slaves. And if you look on the slave records, some of the kings did have slaves. So they were saying the slave lot was down there. I would not recommend going down there. Nobody's maintained it. It's not really clear. But Pete Green donated two lots, this lot and that lot, to the Samuel King Senior Historical Society, of which Gary is the expert. They have done a fantastic job of coming up here and make, trying to maintain and restore the cemetery. During Hurricane Ivan, a tree came down, didn't it? It opened up an entire grave, if I remember right. Anyway, they've had some challenges keeping this up, but it does belong to descendants. And P.T. Green is one of those few developers that we want to really praise and give accolades to for preserving some of the history of Henderson County. And uh, he's now, did he die? I know he had Alzheimer's. He passed away. He passed away. But that's I have a, a different version of that story, I'll tell you. Yeah, that's a <laughs> wonderful thing, though. Anyway, I'm going to let Gary <laughs> proceed with uh, this story. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored to know that this was my poor great-grandfather. Um, in February of 98, I stood right there and for the first time read this inscription, first time visit here, and my jaw dropped. I was just amazed. I had no idea, as did any of my family, that our ancestor was a Revolutionary War patriot. And that was the beginning of my uh, quest to learn all that I could. I've just got a deep passion to learn more and to be able to share what I have learned with others about uh, Samuel King, Revolutionary War Patriot. Um, he was a private in the 11th Virginia Regiment. That didn't mean a thing to me at the time, but I was amazed even more when I began to read and research what that meant. I went to the National Archives down in Atlanta, branch in Atlanta five times doing research. Uh, the 11th Virginia Regiment was a very unique uh, outfit. It was commanded by then Colonel Daniel Morgan. And what was unique about them, they were all long riflemen. Now, very few people knew what a rifle was at the time. That was a brand new invention. The difference between a rifle and a musket, German gunsmiths had uh, immigrated to Pennsylvania, uh, primarily around Philadelphia, Belgium and German gunsmith. They had discovered that if you bore rifles or grooves into that smooth bore, then the projectile will spin. And it's much like a football quarterback as he passes the football, his fingers on the lacing, that puts a spin to the football and makes it go exactly where he wants it to go if he's skilled. That's how a rifle works. That bullet spins and goes uh, and hits what you aim depending on your skill, okay? So imagine 
the word got around to the Continental Congress that there was this new invention and there was this man, Daniel Morgan, who was highly skilled and had prior experience with a number of people in the French Indian War and other conflicts who had this new, they called it rifle gun. He went before the Continental <coughs> Congress and was commissioned on 12 November as a colonel to form this special unit, the 11th Virginia Regiment, the first ever totally long rifle uh, unit in the history of combat. Uh, it is said they were the forerunners of the U.S. Army Special Forces, the Rangers. In fact, General Washington so loved this unit, he called them his Rangers, so they became known uh, two different things that were known as uh, Morgan's Riflemen and as Washington's Rangers. And I'm very, very proud of that fact. I'm just astonished that my family could have been that. But I shouldn't be. I, I see the heritage passed down the line, and, uh, you know, it's in the direct genes. He's my four great-grandfather. My dad, no education, okay, but he taught men to shoot at Fort Blanding or Camp Blanding, Florida in the Second World War. He begged to go to combat and they wouldn't let him because he was too valuable as an instructor. He could shoot a bird out of the sky with a rifle. I'm talking one shot, a flying bird out of the sky. He just had an extraordinary skill. I watched my dad, that old pocket knife I just found and picked up. He took a knife like that, stood it with a blade out in front of a cedar shingle stuck up in the mud, paced off 25 yards, stood and shot, and there were two holes in that shingle. He split that bullet with a knife blade from 25 yards, standing. I've seen him do that. So it skipped me. <laughs> but my, my son, didn't, he didn't know any of this when he enlisted into the Coast Guard upon graduation from, um, from high school and immediately became a, uh, a gunner's mate, later became an expert small arms instructor in the Coast Guard. It's just it's part of the team. So I'm very proud of it. I did uh, become a member both of descendants of uh, Washington's Army at Valley Forge and the SAR. Um, Samuel was at Valley Forge with uh, Colonel Morgan and General Washington. This is a depiction of Colonel Morgan. All the riflemen were dressed very similar to this. They were part of the Continental Army. They were not militia. They were an actual regiment in the Continental Army. But as I say, they were the Rangers and all the riflemen wore these black uh, cock hats. I say all, there were exceptions. Some did wear the traditional coonskin cap, but most wore the black rifleman's hat to denote that they were riflemen. And they were all wore uh, buckskins and moccasins. Not only were they very, very adept shooting the rifle from long distances, but they could also uh, travel great distances with speed. They were just amazing guys. They, they were natural born fighters. 95% of the 11th Virginia Regiment were Scotch-Irish uh, folks that had settled in the mountains of Virginia. We don't know uh, who Samuel's parents were. We do not know with facts as far as the heritage beyond that. But there's very, very good evidence that he is a Scotch-Irish immigrant either he or his father, because 95% of the 11th Virginia Regiment was composed of those old fighting Scotch-Irish guys. That's just, that's who they needed, okay? They were real strong fighters. They were responsible for the great victory of the Second Battle of Saratoga. And we do know that Samuel was taken prisoner of war. We assumed by those dates that he was taken prisoner of war at Saratoga. We assumed wrong. Assuming history gets you in a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> you have to really, really dig. And I have a cousin uh, up in Maryland, Cynthia Sexton, who has a very wonderful gift of being able to read old script that most of us just get disgusted and put down because it's, it's too difficult to read. She found a document which confirmed, you know, the little printed documents. Let me just show you one or two, like this one here. Okay, significance of this one, this did come from the National Archives. You can get these online now easily, but in my day when I was doing all this research, you had to go to the National Archives to get it, okay? Mm -hmm. Significance, date of enlistment, 
December 9, 1776. That's only three weeks from the time Morgan was commissioned as a colonel in order to form the union, the, the unit. He's one of the first men that Morgan recruited. So he had to have known Morgan personally. He had to have had fighting experience and other situations with Morgan or he would not have recruited him. Lots of documents uh, pertinent to all that, but one of those documents says this at the very top, and I had not really noticed this little writing, but the document that Cynthia uncovered had, had it in big writing, and it begged the question, at that point, he was no longer in Captain Peter Bryan Bruin's company, and by the way, companies then were designated by the commander's names, not by alphanumeric designation, some, such as Company Alpha, Company Charlie, any of that stuff. A lot of people see these documents with that letter K, and they assume that he was in Company K of the 11th Virginia Regiment. His name was King. <laughs> the documents were filed alphabetically, so therefore there's a K. That's all that means. The document that Cynthia found showed that he was in a different company. He was in the company of Captain James Calderwood. I have other documents that showed he kind of transferred back and forth for some reason. We're still working on what that reason was. I think we know. But this particular one says the late Captain James Calderwood. So I did research, and lo and behold, all the history books miss this little fact. None of the biographies, I've read them all, are about Colonel Morgan to try to learn about Sam King. None of them picked up on the fact that one company of the 11th Virginia Regiment stayed with General Washington and his army protecting then capital Philadelphia as the remainder of the 11th Virginia traveled on up to New York to protect against the onslaught by Burgoon, okay? That one company of rangers stayed behind. Unfortunately, Brandywine, or the Battle of Brandywine River, as some call it, was one of the worst defeats in our nation's history. Most people don't realize that. 9-11 is, is a terrible day in our recent history, but it was also a terrible day in 1777, September the 11th, the Continental Forces were decimated at Brandywine. We don't know how many lost their lives because there were not survivors enough to be able to document. We have to go by what the British said. The British said at least 1,200 were killed. Hundreds of others were taken uh, prisoner of war because they could not escape because they were wounded. We know Samuel was prisoner of war. We need to start wrapping up. Okay, sorry. I get carried away. <laughs> I love it. Let me just tell you, that's the history of him there. After uh, Valley Forge, he migrated this way, along with hundreds of other men that came down the old wagon road to the Carolina Colony. Okay? Earliest land grant, I've got all the land grants from the state archives, this particular one was applied for on 1 August 1778, 300 acres on the French Broad River, okay? He eventually wound up with about 4,000 acres on the French Broad River at the King's Bridge and uh, one of the largest farms in the area. His farm adjoined the Johnson Farm. The uh, land grants had to be applied with a uh, survey at the time. So obviously he didn't just walk in on 1 August 78 and have a survey done. So he was here obviously before that time, but on 1 August had the survey done and applied for the land grant. It took about 10 years for a land grant to be confirmed and researched and taxes paid and all that. So uh, I can't remember, it was 1790, 1791, somewhere in there that that particular grant went through. He had settled further down this whole area was Rutherford County at the time. Buncombe wasn't formed until 91, okay? Sam had actually settled on the Broad River down in what is still Rutherford County now. But somewhere in that time frame, he migrated back up to Hendersonville, cleared that land, acquired many, many other acres of land. We've got 30-something deeds of Samuel buying land in the area. 
this particular tract of land belonged to Benjamin King, preacher Benjamin King. That's his grave right there and his wife's grave. He was one of the early Baptist preachers in this area. Started uh, four different Baptist churches here. So this used to be the Preacher King Cemetery. In uh, May 26, 1979, members of our family discovered this cemetery and began negotiating with Mr. Wall that owned this land, uh, bought it from the Preacher King descendants. And he wouldn't sell just the tract where the cemetery was. You had to buy the whole thing. Pete Green did that in 95, and the story goes on from there. But we'll cut it short. There we go. And I'm going to, those of you, and I know many.